Oh, this, oh, this microphone, I don't know. Um, I'm very pleased to be here this evening. Uh, this is uh, a very unusual setting for me to be uh, speaking in. I feel I really ought to sort of burst into song. Uh, <laughs> but you'll uh, be relieved that uh, I'm going to resist that temptation. And I shall just give a talk, which is rather more my, uh, my style of business. Uh, a very famous book was written in the 19th century, which was at the time quite widely influential, which was called The Warfare of Science and Theology. And I'm afraid that's a, a view of the relationship between science and religion, which still continues in many people's minds in our day. Those who think that the relationship between science and religion is a battleground usually also think they know who the victor is going to be. Uh, some, perhaps most of those who take that view, think that science is going to win out. Science is, of course, extraordinarily successful, and therefore people are tempted to think that science will provide us with the answers to all the things that we want and need to know. To think that would be a very bad mistake. Science is certainly extremely successful, but it purchases its success by the modesty of its ambitions. It limits itself to asking and answering uh, a particular and restricted set of questions about the world. And it refuses to address other questions about what's going on, which seem to me meaningful to ask and indeed necessary to ask. Science tells us how things are happening in the world, but it sets aside questions of whether there is a meaning and purpose, whether something is happening and what is going on. And those seem to me absolutely vital questions to ask and answer. And they are questions which, broadly speaking, are the concern of religion. To think that science, I have great respect for science, of course, and I've spent uh, the majority of my working life working as a scientist, but to think that science by itself is enough is to fall into the error that we commonly call scientism. We need the insights of science, but we need much more than that. There are some people who think the battle is going on and, the, and that religion is going to be the victor. That somehow religion can dictate to everything else what its thoughts and answers should be. That also is a mistake. We have every reason to believe that scientifically posable questions are scientifically answerable. And in that sense, in that limited sense, science doesn't need any augmentation uh, from theology. There is a certain type of fundamentalism which feels that it can dictate to science what the answers to scientific questions should be. But that is also a bad mistake. I do not believe that there is a warfare between science and religion. Some people who share that belief think that there is no warfare because, in fact, science and religion have nothing to say to each other. And they are somehow or other insulated from each other. Here is science over here asking one set of questions. Here is religion over here asking and answering another set of questions. And really, they're just talking past each other. Now, it's true that science is asking one set of questions, the question of how things happen, and religion is asking another set of questions, the question of why things happen. And it's perfectly true that those two questions are separate sorts of questions and require separate sorts of answers. But of course, the way you answer the question how and the way you answer the question why must have some sort of relationship to each other. They're different questions, but their answers are not totally independent. If I to say to you, I'm just about to go out into the garden. And you said to me, why are you going out into the garden? I give you an answer in terms of purpose. I say to you, I'm going out into the garden because I want to make a beautiful rose garden out there. Okay? I've answered the question, why? You then say to me, how are you going to make that rose garden? I say to you, I've got this great idea. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put down a one foot thick layer of green concrete all over where I want the rose garden to be. You would be, I think, justified in doubting that my answer to the question how fitted very well with my answer to the question why. That green concrete would be a suitable basis on which to construct a rose garden. 
So how we answer the question how and how we answer the question why have some relationship with each other. And that means, inevitably, that science and religion have things to say to each other. And I think that the things they have to say to each other are mutually helpful. And therefore it is a friendly conversation which takes place between science and religion. Because it is a friendly conversation, each side has something to give to the other. Each bears gifts that the other needs. But the relationship between science and religion is not perfectly symmetrical. And therefore the sort of gifts that one gives to the other is different from the gifts that go in the other direction. The gift that science has to give to religion is to tell religion what the physical world is like, what it is like in its present structure and in its past history. That won't dictate what religion thinks, but it will constrain what religion thinks. Religious answers will have to be consonant with what we know about the pattern and structure and history of the physical world. And in a minute I'll give you a few examples of how I think that works out. That's the gift of science to religion, to tell it what the world is like. And religion has to be humble enough and realistic enough to listen to science in that matter. What is the gift of religion to science? The gift of religion to science is this. Religion is concerned to speak of God, and God is the ground of everything that is. And to speak of God is therefore to speak of and to seek the deepest and most comprehensive level of understanding that is accessible to us. And the gift that religion, or the intellectual reflection upon religion, which we call theology, the gift that religion has to give to science is to take the insights of science and to incorporate them in a more profound and more comprehensive setting. I will give you a little bit later on two examples of questions about the world that arise from science, but which are not scientific questions in their character. They come out of our scientific understanding of the world, but they are not the sort of questions that science by itself could ever answer. Nevertheless, I shall suggest to you that they are questions that demand an answer, and I'll also suggest to you that the gift of religion to science will be to provide intellectually satisfying and coherent answers to those questions. So the gift of religion to science is a deeper insight into the nature of reality and what is going on in the world than we could ever get from science alone. Those are the gifts. Gifts that express the friendship and the fruitful friendship that I believe truly exists and indeed is flourishing in our time between science and religion. Let me move first of all to speak about the gifts, or some of the gifts, that science has to offer to religion. Some of the things that it can tell religion about the world in which we live. <clears throat> the first gift that science has to give to religion is to tell us about the history of the world. To tell us that in fact the world, and when I say the world I mean the whole universe, the whole great expanse of reality in which we live, that that universe has a history, and has a long history, and has a fruitful history. That the world as we see it today has not always been as we see it today. That it did not spring into being ready-made, and it did not spring into being a few thousand years ago. The world as we know it came into being 15 billion years ago in that event which we call in science the fiery explosion of the Big Bang. The world then began extremely simple. One of the reasons why scientists talk with great boldness about the very early universe is that the very early universe is a very simple scientific system to think about. It is just a uniform expanding ball of energy and you really can't get a system that's much simpler than that. But it's the 15 billion year history that has elapsed since that fiery start has been an evolving history of increasing complexity. Until today we live in a world that is rich and varied in all sorts of ways, and of, of, of whose history we are ourselves the most complicated and interesting consequences. 
I have a friend who's an American who writes on, on, on science and, and religion. His name is Holmes Ralston. And he says in one of his books that an astronomer peering through a telescope should remember that the most interesting thing in the whole universe is six inches this side of the eyepiece, sitting here inside our skulls. We are the most interesting things in the physical world. Now, what to, so the science tells religion that. Now, what does religion make of that? First thing I want to say is, contrary to what many people suppose, it is not particularly theologically significant to think about the universe having a beginning. There is no particular theological mileage to be had in thinking about the universe beginning in the Big Bang. And the reason for that is this. The theological doctrine of creation is not concerned with answering the question, how did things begin? If you like, with answering the question, who lit the blue touch paper of the Big Bang? It is not concerned with answering that question. It is not concerned with how things began in time. It is concerned with answering, asking and answering the more profound question, why do things exist at all? And the answer, of course, that the religion gives is that the world exists today just as it existed at the moment of the Big Bang because it is held in being by the will of God. God is as much the creator today as he was 15 billion years ago. And that means that though know, talk about the very early universe is scientifically very interesting, it's theologically rather neutral. I'm sure quite a lot of you will have had a go at reading that book by my friend and, and, and former colleague in Cambridge, Stephen Hawking, A Brief History of Time. If you got right to the end of the book, which was pretty good guy, if you got to the right, right to the end of the book, you would have learned that Steve applies his insights about quantum theory to the very, very early universe, and he believes, and it's quite a credible speculation in these terms, that the effect of quantum theory in the very, very early universe is to fuzz things out. That's what quantum theory usually does. It makes things that were, you might have expected to be sharp to be a bit fuzzy, and the result of that fuzzing out is that though the universe has a finite age, it does not have an identifiable, datable beginning. Now, let's suppose that's right. Now, Steve's a very good theoretical physicist, but he's not so good a theologian. And he goes on to say, if there was no beginning, what place then for a creator? Well, I have to say to Steve that it is theologically very naive to answer that question other than saying every place for a creator. God is not just the one who started the universe off. God is the one who holds the universe in being. God is not a God of the edges or of beginnings. He is God of the whole history of his universe. So while all those speculations in A Brief History of Time are fascinating scientifically, they're not really very interesting, uh, in my view, theologically. More interesting is that fact that I've already referred to, that the universe started so simple and has become complicated, that it has an evolutionary history. That is true not only of life here on Earth, but it's also true of the whole history of the universe itself. The galaxies and the stars also evolved early on in, in cosmic history. What do we make of that theologically? Theologically, we understand the evolutionary universe as being a universe which, within certain limits, but within real with a real degree of flexibility, God allows to make itself. That's what we mean by an evolutionary universe theologically, a universe which God allows to make himself. You see, the God who is love is not the God who is in tight and total control of everything, never letting anything happen except by his direct command. He's not a sort of cosmic puppet master who pulls the string to make everybody dance to his tune. And I'll come back to that thought in just a minute. So that's one thing uh, that, that an evolutionary universe teaches us, that God allows the world to be itself and to make itself. And I think it also teaches us, when we think about that amazingly fruitful 15 billion year history, it teaches us that God is not a God in a hurry. God is patient and subtle. And that, in fact, is probably the only way in which love 
can truly work. So that's the first thing. The universe has a history, uh, and that's interesting, and some consequences, but some fairly modest consequences flow from it. Now let me go on to consider a second thing that science tells us about the world in which we live, and again actually about its history, but which might seem to be much more significant and indeed much more threatening uh, to our religious uh, understanding of what's going on. When we think about the fruitful history of the universe, we understand actually quite a good deal about the different stages in that history. <clears throat> and whatever stage we're thinking about, whether we're thinking about the coming to be of the stars and galaxies, or whether we're thinking about the uh, evolutionary history of life here on Earth, whatever part we're thinking about, the fruitfulness always seems to arise from the interplay of two opposing tendencies that are present in the world, two opposing tendencies which we could describe in a slogan sort of way as chance and necessity, the interplay of chance and necessity. Now those are quite slippery words, and I have to say what I mean by them. By chance, I mean simply happenstance, simply the way things happen to be. When the universe was about a billion years old, there just happened to be a little bit more matter here than there. There was just a little fluctuation. There just happened to be a little bit more matter here than there. That's the role of chance, of happenstance. But now necessity comes into play. Necessity means lawful regularity. If there is a little bit more matter here than there, then the law of gravity means that this little bit more matter here exerts a little bit stronger gravitational pull, and so it attracts a little bit more matter to itself in a sort of snowballing process, which builds up. And so the universe that started essentially uniform, begins after about a billion years of its history to become grainy and lumpy, and the stars and galaxies begin to condense. And that was an absolutely essential and important part in the fruitful history of the world. You see what's happening? Happenstance is the source of something new happening. The fluctuation of matter brings about the beginnings of the formation of the galaxies. But the new things that come about through chance would just disappear like smoke in the wind unless they were sifted and preserved by the continuing effects of lawful necessity, of regularity. We see exactly the same thing happening in the biological evolution of the world, perhaps more clearly and familiarly. A mutation takes place, that's happenstance. A mutation takes place that brings about some, the possibility of some new form of life. But that new form of life ha has again to be sifted and preserved through natural selection in a regular environment. Natural selection wouldn't work unless the environment was reasonably regular, and unless the transmission of genetic information from one generation to another was reasonably reliable. Not totally unchanging, of course, because then there would be nothing new but equally not chaotic, reasonably reliable. So the fruitfulness of the world depends upon this interplay between chance and necessity. And the crucial question here is, of course, what do we make of the role of chance, of happenstance? Doesn't that subvert the religious claim that there is a purpose at work in the unfolding of cosmic history? That thought was felt very strongly by a very celebrated Nobel Prize winning French biochemist, Jacques Monod, who wrote a famous book in the early 1970s whose English translation is called Chance and Necessity. And in that book, Monod says, with that sort of Gallic rhetoric and passion, which comes so naturally to the French, he, he says, pure chance, absolutely free but blind lies at the basis of the stupendous edifice of evolution. And of course the point where Mono puts in the knife there is the word blind. You see, for Mono, the role of chance, of happenstance, in the evolving history of the world means that for him, the universe is a tale told by an idiot. What are we to make of that? Well, 
There is no unique way of reading metaphysics from physics, of going from science to a deeper understanding. And I want to take exactly the same facts of natural law and circumstance that Mono knew so well, I want to take exactly the same scientific basis, but offer to you an alternative interpretation. And I venture to suggest a more even-handed interpretation, in the sense that Mono places so much emphasis on chance, and forgets about the lawful necessity, that in fact the fruitful process requires an even-handed balance between chance and necessity. And my interpretation would run something like this. If I may respectfully say so, when God came to create the world, he was faced with a sort of dilemma. You see, God is the God of love, and the gift of love will always be, in some appropriate way, the gift of freedom. We know that from our experience as parents. We have to give to our children the gift of freedom. As they grow up, we have to allow them to be themselves, to do their own thing. Little Johnny, who has learned to ride his bicycle, must be allowed to go off into the dangerous traffic on his own. So the gift of love is the gift of freedom, and God will surely give that to his creation. But of course, freedom by itself can easily degenerate into license and chaos. But God is not just loving, God is also faithful. That's the other horn of the dynamo. And the gift of the God who is faithful will surely be reliability. But of course, reliability by itself can easily rigidify into the merely mechanical. I believe that the God who is both loving and faithful has given to his creation the twin gifts of independence and reliability and that they find their reflection in the fruitful interplay of happenstance and necessity as the universe evolves and makes itself and through the shuffling of explorations of happenstance realizes the God-given fruitfulness, the God-given potentiality with which it has been endowed. So that is my reinterpretation of uh, the problem of chance and necessity. The third gift that science gives to theology is to tell us again something about what the world is like. In the 18th century, following on the very great successes of uh, the theory of Sir Isaac Newton, and as that theory of dynamics was exploited by Newton's successors later on in the 18th century, people began to think more and more uh, about the physical world as if it were a piece of sort of gigantic cosmic clockwork. In fact, they even made clockwork models of it. You know, they made clockwork models of the solar system with gears and cranks and things, and you turn the handle, and all the planets whizzed round in the appropriate ratios. They're called orreries, as I'm sure you know. And uh, so people began to think of the physical world as if it were a gigantic piece of clockwork, and if they thought of it that way, then the best, at best, they could only think of God as if he were some sort of uh, unseen cosmic clockmaker who'd made the clockwork and wound it up and then just let it tick away. Now, in the 19th century, that view got a little bit modified, but still, essentially, that mechanical picture of the physical world remained. And many, many people, I find, still today, think that science tells us that we live in a world that is mechanical in its nature. But that is actually not right, because the great discoveries of 20th century science have shown us the death of mere mechanism. We live in a world that whatever it is, it is certainly not mechanical. It is something more subtle and more supple than that. We made that discovery through two of the great revolutions in our scientific thinking that have taken place in the 20th century. One of them, of course, is the discovery of quantum theory, which came to its full fruit in the middle 1920s. This amazing discovery that this physical world that seems so clear and determinate round about us, when we explore it to its atomic and subatomic roots, becomes cloudy 
and fitful, strange and peculiar, quite different from what we would expect. That strange world of quantum theory. That's a world which is intrinsically unpredictable, where you can only say that this may happen or that may happen, but you can't say for sure what will happen. That's a very great shock. And, and, and we're still, in some ways, 70 years later, trying to come to terms with it and working out fully what it means about the physical world. So let's loosen the physical world up. At its atomic roots, it's a great deal more rickety than we would have supposed it to be. Well, that's very interesting, but I'm not sure it's so significant what I want to talk about this evening. The reason for that is that these quantum events involve very small things. And so when we talk about the everyday world, the world in which we effectively live, uh, that involves many, many, many trillions of, not, not quite trillions, but billions of, of, of uh, quantum mechanical events. And when you have a lot of wickedness, a lot of uncertainty, but you add together a lot of uncertain things, the uncertainties tend to cancel each other out and produce something that in itself then is really quite reliable and predictable. That's the basis on which insurance offices work, by the way. Uh, the actuaries don't know when you're going to die, but they have a tolerably good notion of what percentage of people in your cohort will die in the next five years, and that is enough for the insurance offices to make money. So these things wash themselves out. But we've made a second discovery, more recently than this, in the last 30, 40 years, which is concerned not with the physics of atoms and small things like that, but with the physics of the everyday. We've discovered that that world which we thought Newton had understood and described so well, is in fact very different from the way we thought about it and the way that Newton thought about it. We found, of course, that it contains some clocks, but it turns out that most of that everyday world is made up not of clocks, but of clouds. Now, what do I mean by clocks and clouds? By a clock, I mean something that is reliable and regular and very robust and not easily perturbed. If I have a steadily ticking pendulum, which is part of a literal clock, if I have a steadily ticking pendulum and I slightly disturb the pendulum and I slightly, I bump into the clock or something, that only has a, a negligible effect upon what happens. The pendulum is slightly disturbed, but a small disturbance produces very small consequences. Those sort of systems are tame, they're controllable, they're predictable. And we thought, uh, that that was what all the everyday physical world was like. But we found that isn't so, that we found that most of the everyday physical world consists of systems that are not robust and predictable like that. It consists of systems which are exquisitely sensitive to circumstance. That if you disturb them slightly, they respond so dramatically to that disturbance that their behavior is totally changed. They are so sensitive to circumstance that their behavior is totally and intrinsically unpredictable. The slightest nudge will send them spinning off in some totally different direction. That's a very surprising discovery, but it's a discovery that has been made, and it goes by the very ill-chosen name, as it turns out, of chaotic dynamics. It will not surprise you, perhaps, to learn that this, this surprising feature of the uh, of exquisite sensitivity arose, or was recognized rather, uh, for the first time from studies attempting to model the Earth's weather systems. Uh, the weather is, systems of the Earth are exquisitely sensitive in this sort of way. They are intrinsically unpredictable. Long-term weather forecasting is never going to work. I can tell you that. And in the trade, this is called, as perhaps you know, the butterfly effect. That a butterfly in South America stirring the air with its wings will produce disturbances which will eventually, say in three or four weeks' time, have consequences for the storm systems over Portland. That's a literally cloudy event. So we found that the physical world... We found the physical world is exquisitely sensitive and therefore intrinsically unpredictable and therefore I wish to argue open to the future. The future is not laid down. We are not trams running along tram lines. The physical world is something more flexible and open than that, more subtle and more supple. 
That's a very remarkable discovery. And the discovery is, in fact, a great gain for physics. Because physics begins to describe a world of which we could conceive ourselves as being inhabitants. We know, as surely as we know anything, and we don't need chaotic dynamics or any scientific theory to tell us this, we know that we are people with an open future, that we have powers of choice and agency, that we can bring things about, we can change what happens according to our choice. Not without limit, of course, I can't choose to fly, but I can choose to do uh, a variety of things within certain limits. And the open feature of the theory of chaos is, is, is physics's first successful attempt to begin to describe a world of which I can conceive myself as being an inhabitant and in which I can begin to understand from a scientific point of view how I exercise some power of action in that world. And I believe, and I don't have time this evening to elaborate this point, but I believe that a world that is open to the future, which is supple in its process, in the way that we now know the physical world to be, is not only a world in which we can act, it is also a world with which God can interact. And I believe that it is scientifically perfectly respectable to believe in a doctrine of providence. I sometimes give a talk which is called, Can a Scientist Pray? And my answer is yes, with integrity, taking all that I know about the uh, scientific process of the world, I can believe that the God to whom I pray is a God who is capable of interacting with that world, of bringing things about within its open history. Uh, I could go on listing these gifts for a long time, but I would just speak about one more, because I, I think it's only fair to speak about another gift of science telling us about the physical world that might seem to pose uh, really quite serious uh, problems for religion, and particularly perhaps for the Christian religion. Doesn't science give us this gift? Doesn't it tell us that the world in which we live, despite these opennesses of unpredictability, is nevertheless basically regular. Doesn't, don't we live in a world in which uh, certain possibilities are just ruled out by the regular, reliable nature of the world that science has investigated? And if that is the case, what then are we to make of a religion like Christianity which has at its heart the assertion of a miracle we're within, almost within a week of Easter, and the center of the Christian faith lies in the Christian belief, which I fully embrace, that God raised Jesus Christ from the dead that first Easter day. But how can you, you might say to me, how can you believe that as a scientist in a world whose regularity is so impressed upon you by your scientific studies, a world in which we know Dead men stay dead. How can you believe that there was so striking an, ex an exception to that? Is it possible for a scientist to believe in the miraculous? In particular, is it possible for a scientist to believe in the resurrection? That's a very important and fair question uh, to ask. Well, let me try and uh, respond to it like this. The problem of miracle, actually, if you stop to think about it, the problem of miracle, I think, is not really a scientific problem, it's a theological problem. Uh, you see, science, by its very nature, doesn't pretend to speak of one-off events. But the the there is a theological problem about miracle, which is this. How can God do something totally unexpected, totally unprecedented, and still be a God who is totally consistent. You see, the one thing that is theologically unbelievable about God is that he is some sort of celestial conjurer who decides to do a trick today to impress people, which he didn't think about doing yesterday, and he won't be bothered to do tomorrow. That's theologically incredible. So the theological problem of miracle is Let's put it directly. If God raised Jesus from the dead, why doesn't, didn't he raise, why hasn't he raised other people from the dead as well? 
why do a one-off turn in that sort of way? That's the problem of a miracle. And that's a very serious problem that we have to address. Now, I think we can, we can address it uh, and get some little insight into it by using a sort of parable drawn from science. See, what I'm looking for is I'm looking for some sort of picture that gives us a total consistency but doesn't condemn God to a dreary uniformity. I mean, God can be consistent without never doing anything surprising or unexpected. I have to somehow make those two consistent. And let me take an example from science which shows how that can happen. Let me take the phenomenon of superconductivity. Uh, most metals, in most circumstances, have a sort of electrical resistance. And so if you want to make a current flow through them, you have to have a battery to drive the current around. That's Ohm's law, of course, and, and a very well-established uh, bit of science. It was therefore, uh, must have been absolutely astonishing, in 1911, when a, a Dutch uh, physicist called Kamelionis, who was investigating the properties of metals at very low temperatures, found that with some metals, when you cool them down below a certain temperature, which we now call the transition temperature, the transition point, uh, that behavior, that regular behavior of having resistance and so on, suddenly changed. The resistance suddenly vanished. And you could have a current flowing the metal uh, for a long time without any battery necessary to drive it around. It's a nice, astonishing, totally unexpected uh, discovery. Uh, it's what we now call superconductivity. It was also, I might say, totally inexplicable at the time. It took about 60 or 70 years to figure it out, and it couldn't have been understood in 1911, because it's an intrinsically quantum mechanical effect, and people didn't know about quantum mechanics in 1911. Now, what's the point of that story? The point of that story is this. The laws of physics don't change at the transition temperature. They are exactly the same. But the consequences of the laws of physics change drastically when we move from one regime, the conducting regime of Ohm's law, to another regime, a new regime, the regime of superconductivity. And that's a model, or a parable, for how I need to think about and wrestle with the problem of miracle. God does not change any more than the laws of nature change. In fact, I believe, of course, uh, uh, as, as a Christian, that the regularity of the laws of nature are pale reflections of the reliability of the Creator, who is the lawgiver for those laws. God doesn't change. But in new regimes, in unprecedented circumstances, he may do new things. And I believe that God was present in Jesus Christ in a way that he's not been present in any other person. So the presence of Jesus in the world would represent the presence of a new regime. And it is a coherent possibility, that, that and I believe actually a true possibility, that that new regime was accompanied by new phenomena, even to the extent of Jesus being raised from the dead the first Easter day. And remember that in Christian understanding, what is special about the resurrection of Jesus is not that it occurred, but when it occurred. Jesus is resurrected within history as the foretaste and guarantee of a destiny that awaits all of us beyond history. We too have a destiny beyond death into which we will be resurrected. As in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. So that's how I think of miracle and how I find place for that central Christian miracle, the resurrection, within my scientific understanding of a world that is, that is so strikingly regular in many ways. Right, those are some of the gifts that science has to offer to theology, to religion. And as we've seen, they sometimes provoke puzzles and perplexities, but not, I think, uh, insoluble puzzles or unsurmountable perplexities. I now want to spend uh, the time I have left in talking about the gifts that religion has to offer to science. Remember, those gifts will be the gift of a deeper insight, a fuller understanding than science alone would provide. So I'm going to take two questions which arise from science but which go beyond science's power to answer. Sort of meta-questions is what the uh, philosophers would call them. And the first question is this. It's a fact about the world in which we live that is very, very familiar to us. 
so familiar that most of the time we take it absolutely for granted. It's a, it's a fact that makes science possible, but nevertheless, if we stop to think about it, I think we'll see that it's a very significant fact about the physical world. And it is simply this, that we can understand it. And not only that we can understand it, but that mathematics is the key to the understanding of the physical world. It's an actual technique in fundamental physics to look for theories which in their mathematical expression are economic and elegant, which in a word are mathematically beautiful. Some of you will know about mathematical beauty, some of you maybe aren't quite so familiar with it, but it's a very recognizable characteristic if your mind runs that way. And we have found time and again that the theories that actually describe the world in which we live are endowed with that unmistakable quality of mathematical beauty. So if you have a friend who's a theoretical physicist and you want to upset him or her, you simply say to them, that new theory of yours looks rather ugly and contrived to me, and they will be very upset. Because you're saying it doesn't have what it takes. Now when we use mathematics in that way, if you stop to think about it, something strange is happening. You see, what's mathematics? Mathematics is the free exploration of the human mind. Our mathematical friends sit in their studies, and just out of their heads, they dream up the beautiful patterns of pure mathematics. Mathematics is a pattern-creating, pattern-analyzing subject. What I'm saying to you is that some of the most beautiful patterns that our mathematical friends think up are found actually to occur in the structure of the physical world round about us. In other words, there is some deep-seated relationship between the reason within our mathematical thoughts in our minds and the reason without the structure of the physical world round about us. So that one is the key to the understanding of the other. That strikes me as a very, as a fact about the world which mathematicians, in their modest way of speaking, would describe as non-trivial. Non-trivial is a mathematical word meaning highly significant. <laughs> Math mathematicians speak like Englishmen, they don't indulge in, in hyperbole. Not only does it strike me as significant, but perhaps what is more interesting, it struck Einstein that way. Einstein, you know, once said, the only incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. How does it come about that we can understand it? Why does the reason within and the reason without fit together in this way? Well, you always have a choice. You see, that's, that's the question that arises from science. But of course, science won't explain it because it's part of the founding faith of science that we can understand the world. Every subject has its founding faith, and part of the founding faith of science is that the world is intelligible. And you can shrug your shoulders and say, well, that's just the way it happens to be, and a bit of good luck for you chaps who happen to be good at mathematics. Now, I, my instincts as a scientist are to try to understand things through and through, and I'm not content to be so intellectually lazy as to say, that's just the way it is. So I need to understand why the reason within and the reason without fit together. Okay, you see? Simple. Evolutionary biology. Gosh, if our thoughts didn't fit the world in which we live, then we would have just died out in the struggle for existence. Now, of course, that's absolutely right. But it's only right up to a point. It's right about our experience of the everyday world, the world of rocks and trees, rocks that we must dodge, trees that we mustn't bump into. And our thinking about that world, which in mathematical terms, I suppose means a little elementary arithmetic and a little elementary Euclidean geometry. But when I'm talking about the power of mathematics to enable us to understand the physical world, I'm not simply, or principally, talking about anything so everyday as that. I'm talking, for example, about realms of physical experience that are totally different from the world of every day, that are totally counterintuitive in terms of the world of every day. I'm thinking, for example, of the quantum world. In the quantum world, if you have an electron, if you know where it is, you don't know what it's doing, and if you know what it's doing, you don't know where it is. 
That's Heisenberg's uncertainty principle in a nutshell. Very strange world. The quantum world is quite unpicturable to us, but it is not unintelligible to us. We can understand it, but we understand it in terms of, in fact, very abstract mathematics. Now, I cannot for a minute believe that our ability to invent that abstract mathematics, ultimately the mathematics of spontaneously broken gauge field theories, which I'm sure you'll agree is very abstract mathematics, I can't believe for a minute that our ability to invent that is a sort of spin-off from our ancestors having had to dodge saber-toothed tigers. Something much more profound and, and mysterious is happening in that rational beauty and rational transparency of the physical world that makes science possible. If there is to be an explanation of why the reason within and the reason without fit together, it is surely likely to lie in some deeper rationality, which is the ground of both. And of course, as a religious believer, I believe that I have just that understanding, for I believe that the reason within and the reason without have a common origin in the rational will of God, the creator of the world, who is the ground both of our mental experience and our physical experience. You can summarize what I've been saying so far by saying that as we study the physical world in its rational beauty, it seems to us shot through with signs of mind. And to the religious believer, it is the capital M, Mind of God, which we are reading in the book of nature. Now, I don't present that to you as a knockdown argument for the existence of God. I think there are no knockdown arguments for God's existence or for his non-existence. I think we are in an area of discourse where we don't have recourse to knockdown argument. But I do present that to you as an argument and an insight, really, which is, for me, deeply intellectually satisfying. My claim would not be that atheism is stupid, but that atheism is less intellectually satisfying and less comprehensive in what it explains than is theism. So that's one gift that the religion has to give to science, the gift of explaining why the world is so deeply intelligible. I want to give you a second example of uh, a gift, a question arising from science, which again will go beyond science's power to answer, but for which I believe a religious view of the world will provide an effective and comprehensive and satisfying answer. And this is related to something more specific about the, uh, uh, the nature of the physical world than my first argument. And again, it relates to an, uh, an understanding about the physical world that has only grown up in our minds in the last 30, 40 years, and, and which came as a great surprise to us. And that is this. I have several times in the course of this talk referred to how amazingly fruitful the history of the universe is, how it all started so simple and has now become so complicated. And we've come to realize that that amazing fruitfulness is only possible in a very special and particular type of universe. It is only a universe in a trillion which would be capable of having so fruitful a history. Let me put it this way. Suppose God were to lend you the use of his universe-creating machine. As you approach this, no doubt, rather impressive piece of machinery, uh, you would find that there were uh, whole rows of knobs which you were free to adjust in order to specify the sort of world you would like to create. Now, one of those rows of knobs would be labeled by the laws of nature which you would like to have in the world you are going to create. For example, one knob would be labeled gravity. If you turn that knob up, gravity would be stronger in your world. If you turned it down, gravity would be weaker in your world. So you can set the knob to have whatever strength of gravity you like. In our world, as it happens, gravity is a very, very weak force. You might not think that if you walked out of an upstairs window, but in fact, in the intrinsic way we measure these things, gravity is a very weak force. Anyway, you set the knob to what you want. Next order, the knob of gravity is another knob 
marked electromagnetism. Electromagnetism is the force that holds matter together. The chairs on which you're sitting are held together by electromagnetism. And so are you. Um, okay, now electromagnetism is much, much stronger than gravity, but again, you choose the setting. You choose what to have. Strong, weak, whatever you like. And so on and so on. A whole row of knobs like that. Underneath that row is another row of knobs labeled something like circumstance. Uh, for example, one of them, I think, will be labeled something like size. How big a universe do you want to create? Now, you know, we live in a universe that is absolutely astonishingly big. Our sun is just an ordinary star among the hundred thousand million stars of our galaxy, which is the Milky Way. And the Milky Way is nothing to speak about among the hundred thousand million galaxies of the observable universe. We just can't imagine how big a universe we live in. And sometimes we feel rather daunted at the thought of being the inhabitants of what is effectively just a speck of cosmic dust. Okay, well maybe when you want to create your universe, you'd like something a little bit more cozy, domestic size universe, perhaps the size of the Milky Way. You adjust the knob for that. Okay, you make, you adjust all those knobs. You pull the handle, and out comes the universe you have decided to create. You then have to wait and see what happens, and you have to be patient in this universe business because the natural time scales are billions of years. But you wait to see what happens. And our understanding is this. Unless you had finally tuned those knobs to pretty well exactly the settings that would specify this particular universe in which we live, unless you had finally tuned your universe to be like our universe, the universe you were chosen to create would have a boring and sterile history. It would not succeed in producing any consequences as interesting as you and me. That understanding is called in the trade the anthropic principle. A universe that is capable of producing anthropoi, men and women, is a very special universe indeed. Let me explain one or two of the considerations that make us reach this really very remarkable conclusion. Uh, let me deal with the question of size first of all. It would have been a disastrous mistake to have a universe as small as the Milky Way. And the reason for that is this. How big a universe is, is intimately related to how long it lasts. And if you're going to have a universe that's capable of making men and women, or something like men and women, it must at least be able to last 15 billion years, because that's the time it takes. It's not a process that can be hurried. And the universe the size of the Milky Way would just not last long enough for you and me to appear upon its scene. So when we look up into the sky at night and we think of all those trillions of stars out there, we shouldn't be upset at the thought of them, because if they weren't there, we wouldn't be here to be upset by the thought of them. They are necessary for us to be here. Let me give you an example of what might go wrong with the laws. One of the things you've got to have in a fruitful universe is you've got to have stars. And you've got to have the right sort of stars. Now, why do you need the stars? You need the stars for two reasons. One is, you need a, a good, reliable, steady, long-lived source of energy. All the energy that we have here on Earth comes from the sun, either directly or indirectly through fossil fuels. Um, the sun has been burning steadily for five billion years, and I'm glad to be able to tell you it will continue to burn for another five billion years before things start to go wrong. Um, you need a long-lived and steady energy source like that, because it takes billions of years for life to develop, so it must be long-lived, and of course it must be steady, because if the sun were to flare up, it would burn all life to a frazzle, if it dies down, everything freezes to death. So you've got to have steady, long-lived stars, what we call in the trade main-sequence stars. Now it turns out that the behavior of stars, the way they burn, and the length of time they burn, depends very critically upon the way you choose the force of gravity and the force of electromagnetism. Unless you've got those knobs right, you'd either have stars that were terribly short-lived, that only lived millions of years rather than billions of years, or were terribly turbulent, now flaring up and dying down and all that sort of thing. So that's why you've got to adjust those two knobs. That's one of the reasons. There are lots of other reasons, but one of the reasons why you've got to 
adjust those knobs uh, to get it right. Now, stars have another job to do, which is equally indispensable. They have to make the chemical elements, which are the raw materials of life. You see, the very early universe is very simple, and it only makes very simple things. The very early universe only makes the two simplest elements, hydrogen and helium. And they're not enough for a universe that's going to be fruitful. They just don't have a rich enough and complicated enough chemistry. You need other elements. In particular, you certainly need the element carbon. And the only place you can make those elements is inside stars. Stars are sort of nuclear furnaces. And in the nuclear furnaces of the stars, you can, if you get the adjustments right, you can make all the elements. Every atom of carbon inside your body was once inside a star. We're all made from the ashes of dead stars. And to get those elements right, and to get some of the stars to explode so that when they've made the elements, the elements are freely scattered around to be available for use, that requires very careful adjustment of two of the other knobs on the universe creating machine, the knobs that specify the two sorts of nuclear forces. Now, I don't know how much you follow the detail of that, but it gives you some flavor of how tricky it is how very finely tuned the given scientific laws have to be in a universe that is to be fruitful. Now, again, science doesn't explain the laws of nature. It assumes the laws of nature. But it doesn't seem to me enough when we think about that fine-tuning which is necessary for us to be here to say, well, that's just the way it happens to be. We're here because we're here. I would like to understand why it is that the universe has been so finely tuned. A friend of mine who writes about these things, and who writes extremely well about these things, is a philosopher who works in Canada called John Leslie. And he does his philosophy by telling stories, which is a very nice way of doing philosophy. Um, and he tells the following story. You are about to be executed. You are tied to the stake, and the bandage has been put round your eyes. And the rifles of 12 highly trained marksmen are trained upon your heart. The officer gives the command and the shots ring out. You find that you have survived. Now, Leslie says the one reaction to that which is not rational is to say, ha, here we are again. <laughs> you will want to know, you will want to know why this incredible event has taken place that though the marksmen have fired, you are still alive. That is the only rational response to so remarkable a situation. Now, Leslie says there are in fact only two types of rational explanation for what's happened. One is this. Many, many, many executions are taking place today. And you just happen to be in the lucky one in which all the marksmen miss. That's a possible explanation. But there is another explanation, which is that there aren't many, ex many executions taking place today. Perhaps yours is the only one, but the marksmen are on your side. In other words, more is going on than you realize. Now, you see how that parable translates into thinking about a finely tuned anthropic universe. Some people have said maybe there are lots and lots and lots and lots of different universes with lots and lots of different physical laws a great portfolio of different worlds. If there are lots and lots of different universes with different laws, then, of course, by chance, one of them will just have the right sort of laws for human life to evolve. And that's the one in which we live, because, of course, we couldn't appear in any other. That is the many universes explanation. But notice what sort of explanation it is. It is sometimes tricked out as if it were a scientific explanation, but it isn't. It's a metaphysical explanation. We have no scientific reason whatsoever to suppose there are any other universes than the one of our direct experience. An alternative metaphysical guess of equal coherence, and in my view, greater economy, is that there is only one universe. There is only one execution. But the sharpshooters are on our side. The world we live in is not any old world. It is a creation 
which has been deliberately endowed by its creator with precisely those finely tuned laws and circumstances which would enable its evolving history to be fruitful. Now Leslie suggests that if you're just thinking about the anthropic principle, those two, two interpretations are fairly even-handed. There's not much to choose between the two. And I think I would agree with him at that level. But of course I also believe, and have already spoken about one other reason, I believe there are many other reasons for believing that there is a God and that we live in a world which is his creation. And I believe, therefore, that the finely tuned fruitfulness to which the anthropic principle so surprisingly bears testimony is part of a great and, for me, convincing cumulative case for the existence of a mind and purpose, a divine mind and purpose behind the history of this remarkable universe. Well, I've talked for about an hour, and it's time to, to finish and to have some sort of uh, conversation, I hope, uh, for a while between ourselves. I stand before you as somebody who is uh, a physicist and a priest. I believe that I can hold together those two parts of my experience, not of course without puzzles, but I believe without dishonesty, I believe without compartmentalism, I don't want to be a priest on Sundays and a physicist on Mondays, I want to be both on both days. And I hope I've been able to persuade you a bit this evening that not only can I hold them together in that sort of way, but I can actually hold them together with some form of mutual enhancement. I believe there is truly a friendship between the science and religion, that they truly have gifts to give to each other. And that is possible because they have one absolutely important thing in common. When I gave up being a professor of physics and turned my collar around and became a clergyman, my life changed in all sorts of ways. But in one very important way, it didn't change at all both in science and in religion, I am concerned with the search for truth. And I believe that those who are searching for truth through and through, with openness to that truth, are, whether they know it or not, are ultimately seeking for God. And I'd like to end this talk with what is one of my favorite quotations. It comes from a Canadian Jesuit of this century who died uh, two or three years ago, somebody called Bernard Lonergan. And he very much was in the tradition of thought that stems from St. Thomas Aquinas. And this is what he wrote in, in one of his books, and I absolutely believe it's true. He wrote, God is the all-sufficient explanation, the eternal rapture glimpsed in every Archimedean cry of Eureka. Thank you very much. Okay, well, I can't see the whole too well, but uh, let's turn. Let me show you the whole. Let me just say, there, there are three microphones. There's one over here and one over there, and there's one up above that uh, preferably go to the microphone for questions, and, and uh, John can handle it, or if you just want to stand up, you can do that too. You'll have to indicate in some pretty clear and uh, ex uh, exaggerated here. way that you want to, want to say something, because I, I find it fairly hard with the lights and everything, fairly hard to see you all. Maybe step to the side a little bit. Yeah, maybe. There's a question upstairs. Okay, well, far away. You can't see me, but I can see you. <laughs> yes, okay, well, that's, uh, you have the advantages there. <laughs> I'd like to hear your thoughts on uh, uh, the answers for our species' relationship with our ecosystem and how finding the way that we can sustainably uh, find our role in the ecosystem is in, in that process of seeking that, the, the role of the science and the role of, of spirituality in... Uh, find, finding how we can coexist with, with the planet that we live on and with yes. each other. Yes. Well, I think that they both have a role to play in that. I mean, science obviously has a role to play in telling us about the physical world and helping us to understand its nature and therefore uh, showing us what things we can do uh, to sustain the fruitfulness of, of the world around us and what things we do which will be threatening uh, to the fruitfulness of the world around us. So science has that role to play. 
But then we have to ask the question, why should we bother about the world around us? I mean, why shouldn't we just grab and take uh, what we like? Uh, and I think ultimately the answer to that is that uh, we have to respect the world in which we live precisely because it is a creation. It is valued by God. In, in, in the Bible, the great bits of the Bible that speak about the value of creation are the wisdom writers. Uh, and, and it's very striking. The book of Job is a very fascinating book. And there's poor old Job. He has a terrible life. All sorts of awful things happen to him. And all his friends come and see him. And they say, Job, you, yeah, all this has happened to you because you did, did things wrong and wrong and so on. Come on, come clean with us. And Job says, no, that isn't right. And the argument goes on for chapter after chapter, chapter 37 chapters. And Job says, gosh, if only I could somehow get to grips with God. And on the, in the 38th chapter, God speaks to Job out of the whirlwind. And what does he say? He says, look up, Job, and see the other things I'm doing in the world. Behold, Behemoth, who is a sort of mythical monster who stands for the otherness of creation. Behold, Behemoth, whom I made as I made you. I care for you, Job, but you're not the only one I care for. I care for the whole of my creation. And that is the religious understanding that will undergird a correct and sustainable attitude uh, to uh, our global environment. I would uh, love to answer new or ask you numerous questions, but I'll limit myself to just two. I'm over well, here. Well, one. Let's all one at a time. Anyway. Okay. Um, first of all, I was wondering what your um, vision of God's being is. Is it? Do you vision him or her or whatever as some sort of being outside uh, that is sort of in some way related to mm -hmm. humanity? Uh, yes. Or do you? believe in God as some sort of maybe all-encompassing being that's everywhere? Or how do you look at God? Well, um, obviously, uh, first of all, I, I conventionally use the pronoun he for God, but I'm not so foolish to think that God is male or female. Uh, I mean, God is beyond gender in that sort of way. And God is in some sense beyond everything that we can say about him. All our language about God is language which is stretched. Our finite minds are incapable of adequately expressing the infinite mystery of God. Uh, so we have to use language about God that is the least misleading. We, call, we use personal language about God because God is much more like a person than simply an impersonal force. But God is not just some sort of, uh, you know, old man in the sky. Uh, it's part of a Christian understanding that there is a, and indeed Jewish and Islamic as well, uh, that there is a clear separation between God and his creation. God holds the world in being, and he cares for the world, but he is not in any way, way to be identified with his creation. In that sense, he is outside it. In another sense, he is within it, in the sense that he interacts with it. He is present in the world, in his imminence, but he is not to be identified with the world. And that's very important, uh, because um, the more closely you identify God with the world, the more closely you will tend to identify God with evil, and that would be uh, a mistake. And secondly, uh, the physical world is going to decay one day. Uh, it, it's, the universe is, I mean, it won't happen for tens of billions of years, but the universe is going to die one day. It's going to either collapse or, or, or decay. But God is the ground of an everlasting hope, and it's only a God who is over against the world in his eternal faithfulness who can be the true ground of hope. One more. I have less um, difficulty with the concept of the resurrection than I do with the concept of the Immaculate Conception, and I'm wondering if you could comment on that. Uh, I suspect you may mean the virgin birth rather than the Immaculate Conception, uh, the, 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 or, the, or the version of conception. You're talking about Jesus' conception, right? Um, well, let me say that uh, in the New Testament, every principal book of the New Testament is shot through with uh, the, re the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but the version of conception of Jesus Christ plays a much lower role in the New Testament. It's only really explicitly referred to in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. Uh, so it looms less large on the, on the New Testament scene. The purpose of the doctrine of the version of conception is to make two assertions uh, about uh, the birth of Jesus Christ. One is, he's born of his mother Mary, and that gives him a solidarity with humankind. It's very important that he is really human. He's not some sort of spiritual being who happens to 
appears in the appearance of humanity. He is truly human. He truly suffers and truly dies. But his appearance in history is not just a sort of accident. It is at God's own initiative that God's own Son takes human flesh and comes among us. And the role of the Holy Spirit overshadowing Mary and bringing about the virginal conception is intended to convey uh, the initiative of God that is present in the birth of Jesus Christ. Um, so, yeah. Uh, what is your response to the notion that faith, worship, and or belief is the butterfly, so to speak, that changes some chaotic system that gives rise to the weather that people label as God? Uh, well, I, I believe, because I believe, that, what I believe is this. I believe that the, that the process of the world is flexible and open. And that we have some share in bringing about what happens. God has given us the freedom to do that. I also believe that God has not given away all his freedom, and so God interacts with the world as well. When we pray, what we are principally doing is we are offering our room for maneuver, our freedom for maneuver, to be aligned with God's room for maneuver, and to be used to the maximum effect. Now, I believe that things are possible when our wills and God's will are aligned, which are not possible when the, our wills are at cross purposes with his. I sometimes use the physical parable of laser light. What makes laser light powerful is that it is what the physicists call coherence. That means all the waves are in step. All the crests come together and add up. All the troughs come together and add down. Light that is incoherent has waves that are out of step, a trough and a crest cancel each other out. What we're looking for in prayer, what we're seeking in prayer, offering in prayer, is a laser coherent interaction with God. And I think that brings about things that are not otherwise possible in the world. So I do believe that prayer is genuinely instrumental. I'm afraid I'm going to have to give very quick replies to all these questions. I mean, each of these things would be a, a subject uh, one could you know, talk for half an hour on. So I just have to give you a sort of flavor of how I think about these things. All right. Um, I was wondering how you felt as a theologian and as a scientist about the existence of good and evil in the universe. The greatest problem for religious belief is the existence of evil and suffering in the world. And uh, I don't want in any way to say anything that suggests that there is some glib and simple answer to the mystery of suffering. But I would want to say just three things about, about that. First thing I want to say is this. One form of evil in the world is what we call moral evil. That is the chosen cruelties of humankind, the act of a murderer. Um, I don't believe God wills those acts, but he allows them to happen because he has given free will to human beings. And that it is better, it's hard to say this without a quiver in your voice, but it is better to have a world of freely choosing beings than to have a world of perfectly programmed automata. That is called the free will defense. Now, there's another form of evil in the world to which that doesn't apply, and that is physical evil. What about disease and disaster? Um, now, I think that has a rather similar answer, which I've called in some writing of mine, uh, the, the free process defense. An English theologian called Austin Farrer uh, asked himself, what was God's will in the Lisbon earthquake? The Lisbon earthquake was a terrible disaster that occurred in 1755. It occurred on All Saints Day, and all the people were in church, and the churches collapsed, and 50,000 people were killed in one day. A terrific disaster. What was God's will in the Lisbon earthquake, asked Austin Farrer. Now his answer, which is a very hard answer, but I think it's a true answer, was this. God's will was that the elements of the earth's crust should behave in accordance with their nature. God allows them to be, just as he allows us to be. I think that's true. You see, I believe that God wills neither the act of a murderer nor the incidence of a cancer, but he allows both to happen in a world which he has given a due measure of freedom. Those are sort of philosophical answers, and I find them mildly helpful, but I don't pretend for a minute that they remove the mystery and the painfulness of suffering. But the third and last thing I want to say on this, this subject is something that arises specifically from my Christian belief. You see, the Christian God is not just a compassionate, benevolent spectator looking down upon the bitterness and suffering 
of the strange world that he has made. For we believe in the cross of Christ that we see God himself opening his arms to embrace the bitterness of the world and to be impaled upon it. The Christian God is not a benevolent spectator. He is a fellow participant in the mystery of suffering. That is to be a very profound Christian insight and very much at the center and heart of my own Christian belief. A voice from above? Yes, a voice from the clouds. <laughs> I, it seems in popular view that uncertainty favors religious feelings. I'm not quite sure, but I believe such and such is so. Whereas certainty, especially in the Newtonian mechanical way, is favoring science and fact. This is a fact. You can believe what you want. And it seems to me that the contribution, and you may have said this in your second gift of science to God, the contribution of quantum mechanics is that it has contributed uncertainty at the heart of science, and therefore it's opened that heart to God. Uh, well, I'm a sense sympathy, but not complete sympathy with what you say. Certainly quantum mechanics has loosened up the world. I, I think quantum mechanics has given us two gifts, really. One is that it, it, it has begun this process of loosening up, loosening up the world. It has begun, begun the process of the death of mere mechanism, which I talked about a little while ago. Uh, though I think that has been carried much further by these later developments, like chaotic dynamics I talked about. But there's another thing, I think, which is uh, a sort of gift uh, that quantum theory makes to perhaps the human thought generally. You see, the quantum world is very surprising very different from the world of every day. And it teaches us that common sense is not the measure of everything. It liberates us. The physical world is full of surprises, of which quantum mechanics is perhaps the most surprising. And realizing that liberates us from an undue tyranny of common sense. If the physical world is surprising and strange beyond our expectation, we may truly expect that our encounter with divine reality will also be surprising and strange beyond our expectations. We mustn't make just plain, simple, everyday thought the measure of everything that happens. We mustn't, of course, go to the other extreme and say quantum mechanics is very peculiar, so anything goes. But we must open our imaginations to the rich diversity and strangeness of the world. I think that's quite a useful gift. Over here. I <clears throat> wondered if we could turn to uh, hear from you a report on, um, well, it was a war between religious belief and science, and now it's friendship. And so in the cultural conversations that are in discourse that's going on now, how is your particular conversation, what you're bringing to us today, being received uh, in, this, in this country, around the world? And where do you see... Uh, we are now in, in having friendship and some uh, friendly dialogue instead of warlike yes. discourse. Well, it's a, it's a mixed scene, as you might suppose. Um, I think that there is quite a, a, an active and encouraging friendly dialogue taking place between science and, and, and religion, particularly, actually, uh, on the part of the physical scientists. So he, you had here in, uh, in Portland a little while ago Paul Davis, and some of you will know his book, God and the New Physics, and he just brought out another book called The Mind of God. Now, Davis is an interesting character. I know him a little bit. Uh, he, he's, uh, you see, I'm a pious person. I mean, I've been part of the religious and believing community all my life. And so when I look at the rational beauty of the world and the fruitfulness of the world and see some signs of God's mind and purpose in it, you might say, well, you would, wouldn't you? I mean, that's, you know, the slant of my mind. Uh, I don't think I'm just beguiled by that, but it's natural to me to think in that sort of way. Now, Paul Davis is interesting because he's somebody who has no time for, and I think I would venture to say not very much understanding of, uh, conventional religion. In fact, he thinks it's rather disastrous. So he doesn't have that sort of pious gloss that, uh, that I have, but nevertheless, he too, and there are lots of other people like him, who are impressed by the the fruitfulness and beauty of the world, and think that there must be some sort of mind or intelligence behind it. So in terms of physical sciences, I think a very interesting dialogue is taking place. Um, when we turn to the bi our friends, the biologists, the situation seems to be a little bit different. 
Um, I don't know quite what it's like in this country, but in my own country, uh, there's a good deal of hostility uh, still between the uh, biologists, I'm speaking generally, of course, between the biologists and, and religious belief. Partly that's a hangover from the unwise controversies of the 19th century, but I'd like to suggest another reason for it. You see, biology has been stunningly successful in the last 30, 40 years with all the discoveries of molecular genetics and DNA and all that. Now, biology is always a hundred or a couple of hundred years behind physics. Um, <laughs> Not because, not I hasten to say, because the physicists are 100 or 200 years cleverer than the biologists, but because biology is 100 to 200 years more difficult than physics. Um, and perhaps even more interesting than physics. Um, now, the first successes that you score in a, in, a, in a subject are always the mechanical ones. You always understand the clocks much, much before you understand the clouds. Because clocks are easy, they're regular, they're easy to understand. And the discoveries, the very, very great and, and stunningly successful discoveries of, of DNA and molecular genetics generally are mechanical discoveries, essentially. And that's, ra that's caused a rather rush of blood to the head on the part of the biologists, and a rather triumphalist feeling, and a rather reductionist feeling, I think, among many of them, that this is mechanical, so everything must be mechanical. And I think that's, and that militates then against taking a, a, a more flexible and a more religious and a more perceptive view of the world uh, uh, seriously. Well, I think, if I may respectfully say so, that they will learn. But, uh, so that the, the, the dialogue is in different states according to the sciences involved. It, it varies. Oh, question, yeah. yes. Uh, among the gifts of science uh, to religion, you, you gave several examples. One is you deduced in the 15 billion years of history that God is uh, likely to be patient. Yeah, yes. You also uh, suggested the deduction from the butterfly effect that uh, if uh, butterfly flapping in Brazil affects the clouds over Portland, that uh, God has created possibly a choice. I'd rather I'm confused about that one. I would think that the, it would go the opposite way. That would prove that absolutely everything is determined, uh, not choice. But passing that for the moment, uh, beyond that, you also suggested, however, that God is love. Yeah. You suggested that God is faithful. Yes. Uh, those are harder to deduce from science, I yeah. believe. Of course, yes. I don't, say, and, I don't say they can be. And you suggested that you rely not only on scientific information, but you rely also on some other information, including Jesus Christ and apparently biblical information. The question is, can you explain to someone of a scientific orientation why you would rely not only on scientific evidence, but also on biblical evidence as having equal reliability? Yes, okay, that's, that's a very fair question. Let me say that uh, among my difficulties this evening, I'm getting lots of very big and very interesting questions. One of my difficulties this evening is, that, is, 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 is to deal with the issues thoroughly and, and satisfactorily. In fact, I can't do that. I have to just give you hints. But there is a solution to this problem. Uh, this, I write books about these matters, <laughs> and uh, these books are practically given away and, uh, and are available this evening. So, uh, <laughs> so, so I do there uh, try to develop arguments more carefully. Uh, but let me, let me reply to your basic question. What I would say is this. Of course, I couldn't possibly, I mean, my, my, one of my starting arguments was, that if I'm to really understand the world in which I live, I need to have access uh, to um, experience and insight coming from as many different areas as possible. And I couldn't possibly begin to understand the world adequately, simply on the basis of science alone. I couldn't understand anything about myself as a person. I mean, if I just take science, what's music? Music is just vibrations in the air. But we all know that music isn't just vibrations in the air. It's something that speaks to us of an eternal reality. And, and, and so that I need lots of sources of insight. My instinct as a scientist is to look for motivated belief, to look for evidence and experience that suggests that things might be so. And that is true of my search for religious truth as well as my search for scientific truth. Now the Bible is important, not because it is a divinely guaranteed book in which I can look up the answer to every question, because I don't think it's its character. But the Bible is important, indeed, for me, fundamental in my Christian thought, because it is the record of certain extremely significant experiences in the history of Israel 
in the life and death, and I must say resurrection of Jesus Christ, which are incidents in which God's presence and purpose are particularly transparently present. That's what revelation means. Revelation means moments or people in whom God's presence and will are particularly discernible. God is always present, but he is not always as clearly visible. Just as the laws of nature are always present, but they are only particularly visible in those particularly transparent and in fact contrived circumstances that we call experiments. We need the guidance of experiment to understand the physical world. We need the record of foundational religious experience to understand the religious world. And the Bible is to me, if you like, a source book, a data book in that sense. And, and uh, that, that's how I think about, think about scripture. So I'm looking for motivated belief. I think that's as much as I can say, but it's a very big issue which we could easily spend an hour talking about. Somebody over here. Thank you. Uh, you have, I think, argued for the existence of God as a cause behind uh, many very fortunate arrangements in the universe, the right magnitude of gravity and the other forces and so forth, yep. and many other factors. Um, this leads some people right away to say, well, what is the cause behind God? <laughs> and the answer that I've most often heard on this is that, well, God is in some sense autonomously self-causing. Yes. Now, if this is so, why cannot the universe itself also be autonomously yes. self-causing? Yes. And why do we really need such a sense of separation of God yeah. from the universe? Yeah, that's a very fair question, and, and I'm sure you know that, that, that it represents a point of view that was expressed with very great trenchancy and very beautiful expression, though not to me ultimately persuasive force, by the Scottish skeptical philosopher David Hume in the 18th century. You see, if we're to understand the world, every explanation of the world has to start from some assumed and therefore unquestionable starting point. You get nothing for nothing. If you want to understand something, you have to have uh, a, an assumed starting point in which to explain what's going on, something that you take for granted that doesn't itself require an explanation. None of us can escape from that. That's just a, a fact of reason. And basically, there are two options, I think, if you're seeking a total explanation of the world. You can either take the existence of the physical world itself as your unexplained brute fact, and that was really what David Hume encouraged people to do, or you can take as your unexplained brute fact the existence of a mind and purpose, a divine mind and purpose, as the ground of what is going on. And that, of course, is the view that I take. In some sense, that's the great debate. Now, my answer of why I prefer to take the will of an agent and a divine purpose as the ground of my explanation rather than the brute fact of the universe is that precisely the rational beauty and finely tuned fruitfulness of the universe seems to me to raise questions which don't make it as an unexplained assumption intellectually satisfying. I mean, if I take the world as a brute fact, then I just say it happens to be intelligible and it happens to be finely tuned. Uh, I just don't find that intellectually satisfying. So I have to look for something beyond it. But none of us could escape making some sort of foundational assumption. I mean, that's just ex nihilo nihil fit. Nothing comes of nothing. Is, 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 is just, uh, just true. Yep. Well, given the success of science since Copernicus at explaining everyday experience in the world yep. and being persuasive, has it been the religious camp that has had to make overtures of reconciliation and friendship <laughs> um, in order to just to, to appear you know viable and, and relevant and well it's it's sort of it's sort of ebbed and flow really I mean I I, th I think that one can't give a, a sort of simple uh, cartoon description of, of of the history of the interplay you see it's very striking for example that modern science uh, arose in the setting of Christian Western Europe in the 16th and 17th century, rather than, say, in, in China, which was a very advanced civilization, rather earlier. And all the great founding figures in science were religious people. I mean, Copernicus himself was a, was a canon of, of the Roman Catholic Church, 
And uh, Isaac Newton, for example, was a deeply religious man. He was a very orthodox religious man, but he was a deeply religious man, even to the extent of thinking that his writings on the book of Daniel were more important than his writing of the Principia, which was actually, I think, a mistaken judgment on his part. Um, so that, uh, in fact, uh, science arose in, in, in a sort of Christian setting, and many people think that that was a necessary setting, because, again, the religions of the Near East, the Judeo-Christian-Islamic tradition, sees the world as being God's creation, so worthy of study, sees it as being God's creation and so rationally ordered, sees it as God's free creation, and therefore having an order that can't be figured out just by thinking, which is what the Greeks thought, but has to be, you have to look at the world to see what pattern God has freely chosen to impose upon it. So, in fact, that was a great friendly uh, thing. Go to the 19th century. We think of the 19th century as being the, the, the period of a great struggle and battle uh, between science and religion, because we think of the controversies uh, about Darwin and evolution. Now, first of all, uh, don't be taken in, again, by a, a, a Comic Cuts account of that debate. There were uh, scientists who were very skeptical of Darwin. There were clergymen, like Charles Kingsley, who, uh, and, and, and in this country, Asa Gray, for example, at Harvard, who um, were very welcoming to evolution. And all, I would say, virtually, well, certainly in the English-speaking world, all the great physical scientists of the 19th century, Faraday and Maxwell and Stokes and Kelvin, were all uh, people of deep religious belief. So it's a very complicated story. It, it, it ebbs and flows all the time. Both ways. I have a question relating to the earlier one on the role of uh, quantum randomness. Yep. If you believe that God, like a loving parent, is, has created the universe and is letting it evolve toward its own destiny, and you believe that physical systems are exquisitely sensitive to their initial conditions, yep. then c do you conclude that um, nothing, uh, even at the quantum level, is random? Um, that is, uh, that everything that was uncertain to Heisenberg is certain to God? Or do you conclude that humanity and civilization and everything we know on this earth is uh, more or less an unexpe unexpected surprise to <laughs> God? <laughs> well, I don't believe any of those extremes. I mean, the different, I see, remember, I'm an Anglican, so I believe something in the middle of everything. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't believe any of those things. I, I don't believe that God is, I mean, to use the, genre, the jargon of, of, of quantum mechanics, I don't believe God is the great hidden variable who fixes the outcome of every quantum event. That would be a very unworthy picture of how God interacts with the world. I do believe in a much more nuanced picture, again, which I do just try and describe in my writing, that, that I can convey in the sim rather simple black and white of, of, of an hour's lecture. I equally don't believe that God is totally surprised by everything, but I do believe myself that God has given true freedom to the world. I believe that the future is open. It is not yet waiting up there, waiting for us to arrive. And I believe that's true for God too. I don't actually myself, this may shock some of you, and you probably won't agree with me, but I don't myself believe that God knows the future. Uh, and that's not no imperfection in God, because the future is not yet there to be known. A God, of course, is prepared for the future, and he sees the way things are going, but I don't think God sees the future time laid out before him, like a sort of, uh, like a sort of map. Uh, I, I believe that, uh, that, that, that part of God's self-limitation in, 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 well, when God created the world, something other than himself, he limited his omnipotence, self-limited, only, only God can limit himself, he self-limited his omnipotence by allowing others to do things, allowing us to be agents, and I think he also self-limited his omniscience. Uh, God is not caught out by the future, but he doesn't precisely know what it's going to be. That's more controversial, but I think that's, that's what I think about it. I have a friend down here screaming with me. <laughs> Little baby in the front row. You have mentioned two elements of the Trinity. May I ask how... Uh, Sorry, how uh, yeah, I'd like to see who's speaking. Who's over here, is it? You have mentioned two elements yeah. of the Trinity. How does science relate to the third element, to the existence and function of the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is, is, um, is uh, always the sort of hidden God. The Holy Spirit is, is the God who works on the inside of things. The Holy Spirit is very sort of discreet. Um, I believe that the Holy Spirit is, well, a way of thinking about the Holy Spirit is God's imminent present, presence within the world. He's not identified with the world. 
uh, he, he's not incarnated in the world, for example, but the Holy Spirit is working on the inside of things. I believe, of course, in the evolving history of the world, but I believe that that evolving history is within the grain of the laws of nature, but I also believe that within that grain it is divinely guided, and I believe that is the hidden work of the Holy Spirit on the inside of nature. Uh, I happen actually to belong to the uh, Doctrine Commission of the Church of England, uh, and, and about every five years we write a book about something, and we've just written a book about the Holy Spirit, uh, and, and uh, I do take that very seriously. Uh, in relation to science, that's how I see him, as, as the hidden God who is drawing the world in a fruitful direction. Well, you spoke uh, many times of the God with the divine purpose. Yeah. Uh, what do you think is the divine purpose? The divine purpose is eventually uh, to draw the whole of creation back to himself. God created the world to be other than himself, and he allows us to be ourselves and to be other than him within this world. But our eventual destiny, which will not be realized in this world, but is part of the destiny that awaits us beyond death, our eventual destiny, if we are willing to embrace it, is to be drawn fully to share in the life of God himself. Not to be absorbed by God, not to be drops that return to a divine ocean. We will return, we retain our individuality. God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of individual beings but we will be drawn to share in the inexhaustible riches of the divine life. That's God's purpose. God's purpose is to bring about free beings who of their own will return to him. And that return is, I believe, to be made through the one who is the connection between the divine life and human life, namely Jesus Christ. That's what I believe history is about. Um, um, you, sorry. Or, you, um, you talked about God finally tuning the universe just for us, or well, not, like not, us. not necessarily just for us. I mean, there might be there might be little green men somewhere else who've also grown up, yeah. and I mean, I don't know what God's purposes are, but certainly including us. Yep. Yeah, that was a, that was my question. Now, my question was, yeah. what if God made the universe totally for something else, and we just kind of popped out at it up? <clears throat> out of nowhere and surprising. <laughs> well, I don't think I don't think God made the universe totally for something else, but it's entirely possible that God didn't make the universe totally for us either. I mean, God may be doing all sorts of things elsewhere in the universe. There may be I, we don't we just don't know whether there's life elsewhere in the universe or not, and scientists can't agree about whether that's likely or not. We just don't know enough to to make a, a sensible guess about that. But if there are little green men somewhere else then God will care for little green men. And if little green men are in need of redemption, then the Word will take little green flesh as he took our flesh for our redemption. I mean that perfectly seriously. Uh, and, and so I don't know, I mean, God has lots of things going on in the world, no doubt. But the important thing for us is to know that we haven't just popped out in some uh, unexpected and uncared for way. We are part of God's purpose, though we may not exhaust God's purpose. You said, let's have a go over here for a minute. You said, if I understood you correctly, that our ability to understand is uh, almost in itself a proof that God exists. If in the Garden of Eden, when we were granted the gift of knowledge of good and evil, and became then as gods ourselves, I'm curious how this was interpreted as an original sin instead of some original gift. Do you have a comment on that? Um, the, well, the, the story of the Garden of Eden is, 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 I think, not a literal account of a disastrous ancestral act, but it is a very powerful story that describes the human condition. It describes the human condition today and as it has always been. And the fundamental... It's very, there are two interesting things about... There are many interesting things about this story, but two we might think of just for a minute. One is that it is portrayed as a fall upwards. As you rightly say, it is the gaining of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, uh, and I think that's quite significant uh, and important. But the, the fundamental sinfulness which is described in that story is not the plucking of the apple and the knowledge that goes with it, but it is the desire to be like God. That's what the serpent says to, to Eve. Eat this fruit and you'll be like God. Uh, and the ultimate 
The ultimate root of sinfulness is the refusal to acknowledge that we are creatures, that we are not fulfilled and fulfilling by ourselves alone. We are made, ultimately, as I've just said, to return to God, and we cannot live our lives in total independence of him without making disaster of our lives. That's the fundamental sin, the refusal to acknowledge that we are creatures in need of the love and care of a creator. Question from above. Right? Uh, it seems to me you clearly put God into linear new directional time along with us in the universe, yet I'm sure uh, you wouldn't put him into three-dimensional space along with us. Isn't there a bit of a paradox there, uh, given the, the connection uh, between time and space in modern physics? Well, there is a connection between time and space in modern physics, but they're not identified. I mean, history is still different from geography. Uh, and, and, and so space and time are different, different types of, of entity, though they do go together, with, and of course together with matter as a sort of package deal in, in, in modern physics. Uh, God is also, of course, in some sense, everywhere. And I've talked about the spirit present everywhere uh, within the world. Uh, God is not contained in the world. It's not his habitation. But he's in interaction with the whole of, of, of the world. In that sense, he's, he's, if you like, spread throughout space. And he comes with us uh, uh, through, through time. So I, I, think, I don't think I feel repentant about that. Uh, I don't know. How have you come so solidly to Christianity? What about all the other religions? Well, thank yes. Well, I, I, the first thing I want to say is that it would be disingenuous to pretend that the fact that I'm a Christian is unconnected with the fact that I grew up in England rather than growing up in Saudi Arabia. I mean, obviously, if I'd grown up in Saudi Arabia, the chances are that I would, would have been a Muslim. I mean, we foolish to deny that. Um, but equally, it's also true that uh, the chances of my having been a theoretical physicist were not unconnected with the fact that I grew up in England rather than growing up in Saudi Arabia. Now, we shouldn't commit the genetic fallacy, which is to say that to explain how something comes about is somehow to explain it away. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm partly a Christian because I grew up in England, but I'm also a Christian because I am, in fact, persuaded of Christian belief. And I'm persuaded of Christian belief principally because I am persuaded of the unique significance of Jesus Christ. I'm persuaded that he was raised from the dead. I'm persuaded also that he, uh, that I can not describe him adequately simply in human terms. I have also to describe him in divine terms. Now those statements are big, big statements and would require a lot of justification. I have to say to you that I think a lot about these things and that is my, that is my conviction. But I'd like to take the chance in answering this question, or to say something about uh, how I think about the other great world religious traditions, because it is a very perplexing and difficult problem for a scientist. You see, we're very struck by the universality of science, the exportability of science. If you were to stop somebody in the street in New York or in Delhi or in Tokyo and to say to them, what is matter made of, and you chose a you know, suitable person, they would say to you, quarks and gluons. Uh, there's a universality about science. But if you were to stop three people in the street in those three cities and ask some sort of religious question like what is the nature of ultimate reality, uh, the chances are you would get very, rather different answers in those three cities. And that's very disturbing. There is a stability about the world's religious traditions. And what do we make of that? Well, I want to say three things, I think, about that. The first is that it seems to me clear that the world's religious traditions are talking about, broadly speaking, the same realm of human spiritual experience. And we recognize that. We recognize that in the spiritual authenticity of people that we meet from religious traditions other than ourselves. I remember years and years ago seeing a television program in England which was an interview with a Buddhist Zen master. Now, I suppose Zen Buddhism is about as far from my own sort of religious belief as, as, as really could be. Um, but there was about that person a tremendous spiritual authenticity, which was very humbling, and you could only be respectful to it. So that's the first thing. But the second thing, of course, is having said that, it's also perfectly clear that the world's religious traditions are not all saying the same thing. There really are conflicts between us. And it isn't just manners of speaking. 
I mean, take the question of time. We've been talking about time a fair amount. The religions of the Near East, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, think of time in a linear way. They think of it as a path to be trodden, a sort of pilgrimage view of time. The religions of the Far East, if I understand them correctly, take a more cyclic view of time. They see time as a sort of samsaric wheel going round and round and round for which you should seek release. Now, those are two very different views of time and of human destiny within time. I can't see that they can both be correct. So there are conflicts between the world's religious traditions. And that's a very, very big puzzle. The third thing I'd want to say is that, however respectful I am to my friends and other religious traditions, I must speak for what I believe to be the unique significance of Jesus Christ. I must do that humbly, but I have to do it persistently. So there are great problems in that area, and I, I, I myself am very puzzled about the uh, under, uh, a proper understanding of how the world's religious traditions relate to each other. And I can really not do much more than share my perplexity with you about that. Yes, I, I was very intrigued with your, your comment about um, not really believing that God knows the future. <laughs> and how does, how does that tie in with our understanding of, of prophecy in the scripture, and particularly to that last book of the Bible, which seems mm -hmm. to be so troublesome for so many people? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, I, let me just talk about prophecy generally. I, I think that, that prophecy, you have, we have to see, see what, the, what the nature of prophecy is. And one of the preacher's cliches to say about prophecy, which I think is right, is that it is a, a foretelling and not a foretelling. In other words, the prophets, through the divine inspiration that comes to them, see the way that history is going but I don't think they see future history laid out before them in a sort of, like a sort of cinema film. In other words, they see, if you like, the significant direction of things, uh, so that, for example, Jeremiah has this terribly, terribly unpopular message to convey, uh, to besiege Jerusalem, that they really ought to make peace with the Chaldeans because they have no chance of beating them. And he gets put in prison for saying that. It's a sort of quizzling thing to say. Um, but nevertheless, of course, it comes about. And um, so that, uh, that's what they do. And I think it's very instructive there to think about the prophecies in the Old Testament that relate to God's Messiah, God's chosen and anointed one. As Christians, we can look back at those prophecies and see that they are fulfilled in Jesus Christ. But we can also see that they are fulfilled in a very strange and unexpected way in Jesus Christ. The most natural way of reading most of those Old Testament prophecies is to see them as the prophecy of a military deliverer, a second David. But in fact, their true fulfillment turned out to be in the form of a crucified Messiah. So that I, I think I do believe in prophecy, but I, I certainly believe God sees the way the world is going. But I don't think he sees in detail what is going to happen. The same, the same when Jesus was going to Jerusalem. Jesus knew when he was going to Jerusalem that he was going to be arrested and killed. He saw that was the way things were moving, and he accepted that destiny. Not without great pain and difficulty, as the deeply moving story of Gethsemane tells us, but he accepted that. But I don't think it had been revealed to him, blow by blow, so to speak, what was going to happen to him. I mean, part of the, of the agony in the garden is the agony of uncertainty, I think. 